You're watching Indie Shooter's back-to-back -back coverage of NAB 2019. Sponsored by 16x9, Band Pro Film and Digital, JBC, Manios Digital and Film, Panasonic, Sigma, and Carl Zeiss. Hi, Clint with Indie Shooter. Continue our coverage of NAB 2019 here again with Mitch Gross, Panasonic. We're talking about live streaming. We're talking about uh, multi-cam production. One of the things that Panasonic has been really good about, I think about maybe four or five months ago, was introducing that capabilities to Vericam and uh, the Vericam LT, and it's recently come in the last update to EVA1, right? Right, so, well, first of all, it actually happened about a year ago that we introduced the CineLive concept. Now, the point of CineLive is that Panasonic is known as a broadcast company. We do lots and lots of stuff in the broadcast world. We're also doing stuff in the production world. So one is sort of more live oriented or news oriented, and the other is sort of you know do, doing a shoot and then taking the material and editing, going and having a finished piece. So it's a different sort of mindset, different ways the tools sort of work. Well, what we have found is that we have clients in sort of both of those spheres who are sort of merging. They're sort of overlapping in the way certain things work and how they want to borrow certain functionality out of this to work in that and bring that together. So what happened with the uh, the Vericam is that we released this camera that made very nice Super 35 type imaging and shallow depth of field and high great sensitivity and colors and such. And people were like, well, I want to shoot like multicam stuff with that. I want to do a, live, a concert or a comedy special or whatever sort of things, even some sports events or some in houses of worship. So what we did is we developed a way to have our paint box control system be able the HRP 1000 work with that camera so that you can remotely have you know say six cameras and be able to have these paint boxes make them all match together and send tally to them and all that sort of stuff that people in the broadcast world expect to have because that's just the tools they need in order to do their work so we made the the Vericam work in what we call CineLive well literally the day that we released that people said well, hey, what about the EVA-1? So the EVA-1, more economical solution, a physically smaller scale type solution. We are like, all right, we're going to work on that and develop something. So we worked with some third-party companies, and with our EVA 3.0 firmware that came out in January, we enabled the USB connector here, which originally was to take our little WM50 Wi-Fi adapter, so you could take like a tablet or a iPhone or something and be able to remotely control the camera that way. We made it so you could use several different Ethernet adapters. These Ethernet adapters are like $15. You take a little Ethernet adapter and now that could feed to an iPad or something and you'd be able to have a hardwire connection or to a third party control panel. So we have two different examples. We have a Cyan View and then we also have this one here which is from Scarhoy. And this is a, com a complete control panel system for your camera system here. So it, it's communicating with the EVA-1. In fact, all the work is actually happening in the EVA-1. This is just a communication tool to the camera. But now I can actually fully remotely control absolutely everything in the camera. I can do 16-point pogo color correction. I can do uh, you know my white balance. I can do frame rate changes. I can do uh, resolution changes or whatever I might want to do in this camera, you know, here's my iris, and then I can rotate the knob here and change my black point and stuff like that. So I have all the different controls at my fingertips and quickly able to really access and manipulate the look of this camera so that if I have a multi-camera system, I can then match all of them out and do it like a real production world type thing in a system that is highly economical and yet can still give me HD or 4K and can still give me the dual native ISO and give me that shallow Super 35 depth of field look. look exactly. Like yeah, so it was interesting to me because initially I thought like when uh, you guys announced uh, a year ago, why would somebody want to use Vericam, you know, this expensive camera for like, you know, streaming or multicam on it in a church, but they do these high-end productions that where they do shorts and stuff like that, and then you know it just makes sense to utilize those same cameras instead of having a whole different set of cameras uh, to do their live streaming or multicam for their uh, for their services and things. Yeah. So it's sort of two things. One is that you know some of these 
large church productions, it's an it's quite an undertaking. I mean, you're in in a facility that has 7,000, 10,000 seats in it, and that has a spillover rooms, the giant projection screens and such. I mean, it, it, it for those who are in that community, they know, but for people who don't realize, it's like this is this is quite an enormous production. Maybe seven, eight cameras that are running at all times, and there's a live switching room. You know, it's it's quite impressive, but it's also something where on Monday I could be doing that. Sunday sermons, and then on Wednesday, maybe I pop this off, put it on my shoulder, and go and shoot something else that's a totally different kind of production. So it's a different way of thinking about it. When they are shooting these uh, multicam things of their of a sermon and such, they are really doing a huge production, and they want that filmic sort of look. One of the things that we, that's really nice with this is the way that we can switch frame rates. And so what people like to do, you know, it'll be say 60 frames over a 60 frame signal, or maybe they'll go 24 frame over a 60 frame signal. And so they'll do the sermon, say, at 60 frames a second, it has that very live, in, you know, at the moment feel. And then they'll change the lighting and have a musical performance. And we can do a scene transition along with them and now suddenly we're shooting at 2398 or 24 frames a second and sending that over 60p and it has a different look and feel and it happens seamlessly in the system we can do that on the cinema on the cine live or as well as the eva live systems just simple quick control and that is a sort of a function look that it's very unique to panasonic that we can do that maintain a sort of very nice attractive cinematic look and it lends a different sort of feel to the, their productions that they really like. Let me ask you, I mean, normally when we talk about uh, EVA1 and Varicam, we think of uh, log footage. So how do we, for live, how do we make sure that it looks, you know, finished, saturated, the saturation contrast is all there? Right. Well, you know, everyone in our production community might think of this camera as, oh, shooting in log, V-log, V-log, V-log. Well, that's great. But you don't have to be in that. We have a number of scene files. And in fact, our scene files have available to them not only the traditional basic controls, but you can actually get quite deep in the image controls so that you can do 16 point color correction where it's, you know, the red greens in the highlights and then something else for the midtones and just you know, really, really deep color correction of a very advanced camera system. And that's in just baked, you know, built into one of the scene files for a live output. And in fact, on both the EVA1 and now just introduced on the, the Vericam, so for CineLive as well as for EvaLive, we have HLG. So you can be doing HDR production and having a live HDR output for in the form of HLG, which is a delivery system for HDR in a live mode, and you can take you can take advantage of not only that extreme dynamic range, but also the Rec 2020 color space. Honestly, there's not even a lot of monitors and systems that you can use to view that, but for the ones that you can, here we are with a live system that can show a range that is really quite impressive. I mean, I, I do really believe that, unlike things like, say, 3D or VR that were a little bit faddish, uh, everyone can appreciate what HDR looks like. As soon as you see it, I mean, you know, the extreme contrast that's available, like, okay, that's fine. You know, like, you know occasionally I want to have a highlight that peaks out and whatever I'd like to see into the shadows. What really gets me is the Rec 2020 color. When people see what that looks like, I, I, I liken it to sort of a depth of the color. There, you have a roundness to things because instead of like a face just seeming like, you know, one tone of sort of a peach kind of color or whatever, you can see all these gradations in it and it gives it a sort of depth to the color. You can see, uh, you know, detailing in it that lends it, you know, a, a, a more natural feel and you just kind of, kind of reach into the screen and see it. Well, that is all available right here on the output of this camera, then and you can do it live. So you can paint to, to your heart's content and just have it going right out in HDR if you want. Or, you know, regular SDR like we've been using. Have you seen uh, a multicam EVA1 uh, set up like in the real world? Uh, well, the thing is that 
we are just really introducing this now. So that even though the firmware made it available in the beginning of January, in the, the end of January, we uh, have just gotten this enabled with the SignView system as well as the Scarhoy system so to be able to control that functionality. So there were some people who were using doing multi-cam work with EVA1, but it was a little bit rudimentary in how, what, what you could do and how you could set it up to control it. So now we have that complete control system and we've had a lot of interest here at the show of people who want to build out their systems, you know, going to immediately buy these the, the, the control systems to be able to flesh out the camera systems. And we're, we're going we're to see this in both in education, house of worship, some corporate work and such, you know, like some uh, corporate seminar thing. So we're, we, we expect to see this uh, expanding out pretty quickly. Well, I think so, because I mean, I know for especially the independent filmmakers and, and production people that are out there, you know, it's one thing to be able to go and shoot somebody's spot, but another service you can offer is live streaming because it's people want a multicam live stream. And so it's another stream of revenue that you can bring in if you have it set up. Yeah, I mean, there's, I talked to a number of people who do uh, event work where they'll, they'll, whether it's for a corporate announcement or a press conference sort of thing, or just a seminar type thing where they're gonna be not only covering it to have something that goes on the, on the net, or it's just a you know a finished video they provide, but also they're doing that live switch and it's going right up on screens behind their subjects, right, <laughs> at the same time, the iMag. So that all is, you know, that's very real production and that's real work that people are doing all the time. And they're all, again, this is where that bridging I was talking about happens because a lot of people might be in production, quote unquote, and, you know, with having your crew and shooting a take and getting scenes at different angles and stuff. They're doing that one day, and then the next day, they're doing a multicam setup because that's the work, and that's it's all very legitimate work that's very, uh, that is all can be very high quality. You know, sometimes people look down on certain kinds of work, like, oh, well, that's a different kind of thing than what I do, you know, and, and it can go either direction. But what we're seeing more and more is good quality work is good quality work, and your clients want to have the highest quality image that they can get on whatever sort of work they're doing. So we're starting to see a real bridging of that where people want to be able to have, you know, oh, well, the look of something from that TV show or that movie, I would like to have that sort of feel, but in my live event. And so we're seeing that sort of stuff bridge together. I think so. And uh, the other thing is, I mean, as you're trying to distinguish yourself amongst your competition, you know, people will look and say, well, you know, his live streams look different. They look cinematic. We, we want that look, you know? And, you know, it's some more value you can offer to potential customers that are out there. Uh, and especially if you already have this camera, it's not going into an entirely different system and everything like that that you can only use for live streaming. The versatility is amazing. So the update came out in January and the EVA one, and uh, people are just, they still love it. I mean, the you're on Facebook, the Facebook groups, and, uh, and uh, the, I mean, it's just as vibrant as it ever has been. Yeah, I mean, some of the other stuff that we introduced with the firmware 3.0 is uh, a new uh, additional codex. So we have uh, shooting, in, shooting in 4K up to 60 frames a second, now in 10-bit using H.265, the HEVC codec. We also introduced Quick Switch, and Quick Switch is sort of an over, over the description of you know sort of a set of features but it really came by way of requests from our clients because people are like you know if I want to go from shooting 4k at 30 frames a second and then I need to quickly shoot something at 240 frames a second well it used to be that you would have to go into the menu here and get to a couple of different controls and dial through to a couple spots and then the camera resets itself and you know and not that tough but you got to remember what it is but it's also in the thick of whatever you're shooting sometimes you just don't have time to deal with that so quick switch would be where we can program a user button and it will immediately take you to your setup files menu and your setup files are like something you just preset and it can be, it's literally every single setting on the camera. So I could do this, so I would pick the setup file I wanna to go to, let's say now I'm gonna to go to 2K, 240 frames a second, push that, a few seconds later, camera's ready to roll, I've quickly switched my mode. But I can do that on sort of anything. I could, 
you know, be from going from indoors to outdoors and just, you know, all the different parameters I want to have, you know, adjust for that, you know, whether it's color, color temperature and the sensitivity and whatever it might be. I'm going to, maybe I want to change my noise levels or something, you know, have smoothing going on or something. I don't know, whatever it might be. I might have, it might be something where I'm just on tripod and I'm going to handheld mode. When I'm in handheld mode, well, I want to have certain controls on the hand grip and certain things. So like, okay, boop, let's push the button and it's done. I can pre-program all that stuff. You save it on an SD card. For those settings, you don't have to have a high powered SD card that can actually record. You could just have it as a cheap little SD card that's good enough just to hold your scene files and your setup files. You stick that in there and program in whatever you want and away you go. So that was something that was important to us to make it easy to use all the capabilities of the camera. And this is something that specific, specifically came around because users were, were requesting it. They were like, well, you know, can, can do so many things and change, but it can take time to get through the menus. Can you come up with a way to make it easier for us to go between different settings in the camera? Let me ask you, I mean, you're a, you know, the, the community that's around this camera is, you know, it's been organic and it's been beautiful and people are really open about sharing their work and everything like that. And I know you're in touch with a lot of end users and you pay attention to a lot of the stuff that people are doing and putting out there that they uh, utilize this camera for. What's one of the more or most unique ways that you've seen this camera used or one of the most incredible productions that you've seen that EVA1, like maybe that you came across? First off, we really believe in being in touch with our community, being in touch with the users. One, because we want to get the feedback of how people are using. That's how we learn to you know, make the cameras better and add certain functions and whatever. But it's also, it helps us understand how they're using the tools so that we know what is and isn't working for people in the tools and what we might want to change for a next camera or something or whatever it might be. And also, it's a lot of education. So, so much of the time, people simply do not understand what your devices can already do or just how to do something simple on it. And so, just by being in communication with people, it's just a way to help them, you know, we did a lot of work. Engineers really, really did a lot of things to build into the camera, and people might not recognize, realize they're there or know how to get to them. So we want to just always be able to explain to people what it is and why we did something a certain way so that they can, you know, hopefully understand sort of the ethos of the camera to get more out of it for themselves. It's really for, you know, try to give them their benefit. At the same time, we have, we always discover new different things that people recognize, you know, like, we don't know everything. So it's like, well, hope, we're, we're hoping that it answers the call for people, but one of the things we found is that not only lightweight and, and small camera, but also it, it, we work very hard on the color science in the camera. So it has the same ca color science in this camera that you find in the Vericam, and you know and our, our cameras match out very well. One of the things that we learned because the users told us is that in underwater photography, the way that it's sensitive, you know, that uh, because of how light gets filtered through water, uh, well, not only diffuse, but the color shift that happens naturally uh, because of the color of water and so how it affects the blues and the cyans and such, some cameras will render that in an odd way and you have to do a lot of color correction work in post to get it to look normal or comfortable kind of because it just sort of shifts the colors in a, such an extreme way and it makes the sensitivity of the cameras weird because they're only getting certain color channels and stuff. We learned that this camera performs extremely well in underwater photography. So uh, we actually have a, a short film. Uh, someone that we met by way of our Share Your Vision contest yeah. that we did over the summer of, again, wanting to see what people were doing, what the users were, were you know, how people were using the cameras. We found this fellow, David Diley, in the EU. He is an underwater cinematographer. He has a Nauticam housing uh, that we're actually showing here at the show uh, that the camera is built for, uh, or it's built for the camera, that I should say. And it even, the uh, secondary housing for an Atomos recorder to then marry with it to then record in RAW if you want to. 
and he, he did his couple of his own films, but now he's done another short film that we worked with him on because uh, it really sort of speaks to a particular community that we didn't even realize. I mean, it's like, you know, yes, we know there are people who do underwater photography and stuff, and we had, we had talked previously to, you know, Nauticam and some other un underwater housing companies to say, here's, you know, please make a housing for our camera. It's small and lightweight. We think you, people might want to use it. Then we discovered that underwater cinematographers absolutely love it because of the way it renders colors and it makes these re really beautiful images for them. So we're like, okay, terrific. Who knew? <laughs> I didn't realize how many uh, people are actually doing underwater. You, you always think it's just a small population uh, of camera shooters that are doing it, but there's way more than I thought was uh, out there. But that's, uh, that's amazing. And people can see those films, right? Yeah, so the Share Your Vision uh, contest, all the, all the entries to it, that's all available on the, our, our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube and Vimeo channels is uh, just you know the Pan the the um, Panasonic uh, uh, Vericam slash Eva One uh, YouTube channel, and then we have lots of different uh, pieces there. The different uh, some are documentaries, some are narrative pieces, some are more sort of commercial type productions. But it's just a great variety of different things that we have uh, available there, including some of that underwater material as well. And we have a new piece that was just done underwater, and so that that's going to be on our channel as well soon. Yeah, and as uh, people are shooting with the camera and you know they want to show the work, there's uh, also a lot of Facebook groups that are on uh, Facebook that uh, are very vibrant and, and people can post their videos there and uh, show like what they're actually doing with the camera yeah. too. We have a very active Facebook community uh, that in, in several groups that are talking, you know, basically if you go on Facebook and you just do searches for EVA1, you'll find several different groups. Uh, you know, some are private closed groups, some are public open groups, there's just a different things that are available there. Uh, and I try to be active and, you know, hard to you are. up sometimes. <laughs> but you try to see, uh, uh, and it, I'm, I'm not there to steer a conversation as much as I'm there to just try and, you know, answer questions when people have it, and then also to to sort of clarify information. A lot of times people like, are, they, they think they understand what something is, or they, but you know, you just give them a little touch of information and now they understand how something works. Someone the other day had something with a, a, a power question uh, and I just explained exactly what the camera is, does and it was actually a protection circuit built into the camera. To, it was a good thing and they were like, oh, well that's, that's great. Okay, now I had no idea. I didn't realize what that did. And, and then a bunch of other people chimed in and now people understand how the camera works. That's what's important to us. We just want them to understand what is going on with the machine. Mitch, people want to find out more about uh, uh, EVA1. Uh, they also can go to the Panasonic website. Uh, just go to Panasonic and search EVA1, yeah? Absolutely. So the full name of the camera is the AU-EVA1. There's, depending on what country you're in, so it might have like PJ or Y or something after it. But that is going to have... If you search on the U.S. Uh, website, there, you know, North America, or you go to our international website, it's going to have lots of different information about it. We have, we have not only the manual for the camera, but we we uh, commissioned Barry Green to write uh, a complete book on it. There's sort of a handbook to it. There's a bunch of instructional videos. I did some videos. Barry did some videos. We have a bunch of downloads that are available of the charts and. Uh, just technical documents and lots and lots of information. So you really, you could really populate your time with lots of information to learn all the different things that the Evo One can do for you. Excellent, Mitch. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. You're watching Indie Shooters back-to-back -back coverage of NAB 2019, sponsored by 16x9, Band Pro Film and Digital, JBC, Manios Digital and Film, Panasonic, Sigma and Carl Zeiss.